Welcome to The Details with Adam Frower and Cecil Walker. This is a podcast where we examine the intersection between solution-focused brief therapy and current topics happening in the world. And we do this because we genuinely want the world to be a better place. So enjoy and come and examine the details with us. So Cecil, today you and I were talking a bit about current events and what's going on Mm -hmm. in the world around us. And one of the things that we started talking about is social media and things that happen in the social media realm that maybe don't happen elsewhere. And that led us to this idea of hashtags and how we have in a sense become a hashtag society. And I'm wondering if you can fill people in on what do we mean by that, a hashtag society? Well, the best that I understand it is that with social media being such a prominent aspect of a lot of our daily lives, people have had to get pretty good at navigating it, posting it, understanding it, consuming it. And hashtags have supposedly, you know, made that a little bit easier, a little bit more refined. And so I think what we've started to see with hashtags are that the ways that people describe and post and refine their their social media content starts to really look like it's like reflecting something important about us. You know, it's starting to show what are the things that we are spending our time on, our attention on, what are the things we think are worth showing other people and getting their attention, what are the things that we think could really define who we are to other people. And so I, I think it is something really, really interesting to look at, which is probably why we're talking about it now. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's true. I think so. One of the things that we did kind of in preparation for this is to kind of look at what are the most common hashtags. Right. And there was a part of me that was really surprised by some of the things that were on the list. <laughs> and there was, there was a part of me that was not surprised one single yeah. bit about what was on the list. But I guess we should just start with the number one hashtag. And this is on Instagram. On Instagram, yeah, true. On Instagram and in the year 2022. Mm -hmm. So just this year. So it might have been different in years past. But the number one hashtag for 2022 on Instagram is hashtag love. And that has been used, that hashtag has been used 1.8 billion times Mm -hmm. already this year. And I think like you were saying, that gives us a glimpse into what people are valuing what people are seeking, what people find important. And I think it gives us an idea about, at least societally, what we're valuing. Mm -hmm. Um, So what sense do you make of that? Well, when it comes to social media, I see it as a two-way street. You know, sometimes when you're creating content or posting content, it's not only showing something about you but it also is showing something you think other people can relate to or interact with, or, you know, you can connect over. So it's not even that this is just something so specifically and minimally important. This is something that could be globally important. This is mm-hmm. something that I know will, you know, make sense outside of myself as well. And so for love to be the number one, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? You know, it seems like we are born into this world with a huge capacity for that and, huge want for that, a huge enjoyment of that. So I think that makes a lot of sense, maybe even more sense than some of the other things that are on the list. <laughs> true, true. Which I guess begs the question, what are some of the, the, the second one, I think, is one of those examples of how did that possibly get to the top of the list, <laughs> which is hashtag Insta good, mm-hmm. right? Which, I mean, could be a whole host of things. A lot of different things. And I think really it highlights that we're now also making up new vernacular, right? Mm-hmm. There's no real word that is insta good, <laughs> but, but it could be like, this is something that I deem good and I want it to be seen by other people. Mm-hmm. It could be like only in the Instagram world might this be deemed as mm-hmm. something good. And so I think that that's, you know, kind of an, another, which is funny because it's also been hashtagged over a billion times, yeah, which is that's incredible. unfathomable, really. <laughs> but I think one of the things that we talked about, and we can get back to the rest of this list here, but one of the things that we talked about as we were talking about these hashtags, as it, in some sense, we can think about these on a personal level as well, maybe even a hypothetical level, 
But in some sense, we kind of think about it as what are my own, if I had to portray who I am, if I had to put out there an image of what's important to me, what do I value? If I had to hashtag, you know, my own top 10, what are those things? What would be the most accurate depiction? Not that Instagram is always about the most accuracy, but if I had to label with a hashtag, what I value, what I think is important, what would those things be? And I think obviously hashtag love speaks to, Mm -hmm. for many of us, that's something that we're seeking. That's something that we value. And we were kind of also talking about in a world where a lot of the relationships that we see, right? We hear about the Kardashians and the seems like the revolving door of relationships that seem to be happening with the Kardashians. We just went through the whole Johnny Depp, Amber Mm -hmm. Heard situation, right? So the types of relationships that we get exposed to, it brings into question, would we, would we put hashtag love on those relationships? And then we can, again, bring it to a personal place for us. And we think about our own relationships. Maybe that's a relationship with our partner. Maybe mm-hmm. that's a relationship with our children. Maybe that's a relationship with our friends. Would we put hashtag love in association with those various relationships? Mm. Would that be a part of how we would describe those things? And so I think thinking about this concept of using hashtags, it might give us an indication of how we live our lives. What kind of things do we value? Yeah, this is such a fascinating window, I think, to look through because as you and I have had described before, I don't think it's a given that everyone has distilled down what are the things that I value How do I make my decisions? What's allowing me to prioritize what I put my energy and attention towards? And I think to some people, that's a detrimental thing that they're not able to distill those things down and identify those Mm. things to navigate their lives. But in a way, you know, if a couple billion people are using hashtags and, and doing these things, we've kind of indirectly done that with hashtags. So that's why I say this is such an interesting window, because now it's starting to show us What are some of these things that we might be valuing? And so, like you're saying, when we look at it on a personal level, what might be our own personal top 10 hashtags that we would use to say, here are the things that are important to me. Here are the things I want to really fill my life with or gear my actions towards or define myself by. So I think not only is that a valuable process to go through to be able to identify those things, but I think where it gets you to, which is probably what we'll talk about is a place where you're actually becoming much more fulfilled, which isn't, you know, a word people would associate (laughs) with Instagram or social media, you know, how do you get fulfillment out of these things? But if you're able to see in a pretty transparent way, what's important to me, I think that's a main ingredient in fulfillment. And like we were saying earlier, being able to seize opportunities that show up to you. Yeah. I think you hit on a couple of things that are really important. And I think in some sense, in order to know what to portray to people, what to portray to society, how do I want to be perceived? I have to, in some sense, know my own hashtags. Like, Mm -hmm. what are those things that I value? And then, like you mentioned as well, that helps me. One of the things that we were talking about is like, there's so many opportunities out there to be had. There's experiences that you can have. There's different foods that you can eat. There are different people that you can bring close to you or keep far away Mm -hmm. from you, right? So there's so many different opportunities that in some sense, I constantly have choices around which of those opportunities do I want to seize on to. And when we take the time to evaluate our own hashtags, that gives us a filter to put those potential opportunities Mm -hmm. through. I can say, does this particular opportunity, does it mesh with my top 10 hashtags? If somebody's trying to connect to me or come closer to me, I can put it through the filter of, is this the kind of relationship that's consistent with my top 10 hashtag? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like this two part of, I have to know myself well enough to outline what are my hashtags, Mm -hmm. but then I have to say, when making choices, I have to evaluate them against those hashtags and say, is it consistent? Mm -hmm. I think this is so fascinating because in a way, people kind of have to do that for the pictures they're putting on Instagram, right? If you're going to do hashtag friends, hashtag friendship or something like that, 
you have to create a scenario that looks like you and your friends are, are having a good time. And so then you have to make the decisions or the investment in let's do something, go somewhere that we could, we could take a picture that looks like our friendship is, is a really high quality friendship that I could put on Instagram. I mean, obviously removing the social media aspect of it and the, the presentation aspect of it, you could essentially still do the same thing with your own personal hashtags. If friendship is really important to me, I need to make sure I'm making decisions and creating experiences that really show that happening, that really make that present in my life. Yeah. And I think one of the things that you just raised, and one of the things that oftentimes comes up when we talk about social media is that we can't really even trust what's there, that oftentimes it's an inaccurate depiction of reality. Mm -hmm. And I think the same threat is possible when we create our own list of hashtags, Mm -hmm. right? I could arbitrarily put things onto my hashtag list that I think should be on there. Maybe it's not what I actually value, or maybe it's not what I'm actually capable of, but I might have that social desirability of this should be on my list because society tells me it should be on my list or because the rest of my friends would have put this on their list or, and I think that just like social media, we have the opportunity to be genuine or we have the opportunity to be, I guess, disingenuine. Mm -hmm. We could fool ourselves And I think that that would undermine what we're actually talking about. If I'm just putting things on my top 10 list because I think other people want them there or because I think I should have them there, I'm not actually going to find Mm -hmm. real joy and real satisfaction. I'm going to continually be let down, which I think we hear about so much in Mm -hmm. the news, right? That especially with young people, They're looking at social media and it's leading to things like depression and anxiety Mm -hmm. because they're saying, I can't have the kind of life that other people have, or that reality is outside of my grasp. And I think if we're not really genuine with ourselves, as we think about what are the hashtags that should be a part of my life, we could inadvertently lead ourselves down a similar path of disappointment. I'm I'm glad you raised that point because I think it stops us from overlooking a pretty big jump in this conversation. And I think that's, how do you know what's good for your hashtag list? How do you Mm -hmm. know what's a value that you should accept into, you know, saying, here's something I want to live my life by? What you've kind of already thrown out is that it needs to be genuine and and it needs to dictate the actions that you take and the ways that you um, kind of guide yourself. But how am I supposed to know if it's supposed to be on that list or not, if it's a good fit for me and the things that I'm trying to do? I think this process might be a little bit different for each person, but I think in some sense, there's going to have to be a lot of self-exploration, right? Where I'm going to have to say, what do I really like? Which might mean I have to try things that I've never tried before. That might mean that I need to go places I've never gone before. And then really say, did I like that or did I not like that? Did, did that bring enjoyment or did that not bring enjoyment? I think too, we might have to do a combination of things on our own, right? I think sometimes what we think we like when we're with other people mm-hmm. might just be influenced by I'm having a good time with these people. And I may not actually like the activity or whatever's happening in that moment, but I can overshadow that with, I like being with these particular people. And so I think we might need to spend time on our own doing activities, really getting to know ourselves, Mm -hmm. really evaluating, is this good for me or not? But I do think also we need to spend a little time with other people. And I think that that there's kind of concentric circles to that, right? We might need to spend some time with our immediate family and say, what happens in my immediate family that I enjoy? What happens in my immediate family that I don't enjoy? And then similarly go out to larger and larger groups you could take that all the way to the extreme of like, where do I want to live? Do I value the society, the community that, I, that I'm embedded in? Do people in this community have the same beliefs that I have? Do they vote the same way that I vote? Do they? And so I think that it, you could take that a point of evaluation and go outwards. I guess I want to just add too, that it's not necessarily that I can't be in a family or in a community where people have different hashtags than I have. I think there's something really enriching. One Mm -hmm. of the things that's so great about Instagram is that you get to see so much variety, right? You get to, you get to experience the world in a way that you would never have done on your own. 
And I think that there is something really valuable about difference and about kind of experiencing the world in a new and different way. So I'm not saying that you have to align yourself solely with people who would put the same things on your list as you do. But I think that helps you to understand what should go on my list and what shouldn't go on my list. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot for people to think about, obviously, in this. But I think what makes it worth it is what you get out of this. Like you were describing earlier, you, you get this much clearer sense of how to bring yourself some really meaningful satisfaction. I think you gave some, some brilliant examples when we were talking about this earlier, how you were to take the opportunity to go on this spontaneous trip somewhere that could really show or even fulfill your commitment to getting most out of life, travel and, and mm. you know, independence or spontaneity or something. Those happen to be some of your, your hashtags. But on this other hand, if stability or long-term planning, family, and responsibility, if those are some of your top hashtags, I don't think uh, you know, a suddenly planned trip to Mexico or something would fulfill those things and would probably end up with maybe some more dissatisfaction than satisfaction. So there's work in establishing what are your hashtags, what are the things that you value, but there's a lot to enjoy. I think once you get to this other side of being able to say, well, here's how I'm going to make the decisions that I make now that I know what I really value. Yeah. I think along those same lines, once you get things on your list and once you understand yourself really well, that also helps you make really deliberate choices about who else you want to associate with and how, Mm -hmm. right? And one of the examples that we gave before is like, with my partner, Mm -hmm. I can very much identify, I could guess several things that she would put on her list, right? I know what she values. Mm -hmm. I know what kinds of experiences bring her a lot of joy. I know that food is something that she really cherishes and creates memories with, right? And so I think that gives me also knowledge to say, if I want to enhance this relationship, maybe I need to put on hold my hashtags for a minute, and then maybe I need to cater to her hashtags Mm. for a minute. So that same spontaneous trip, maybe I go somewhere where I know she would like to go rather than somewhere I would like to go. And maybe that means that some people might look at that and say, well, you're sacrificing your own you know, your own hashtags, Mm. but maybe that teaches me that relationships or or this particular relationship is one of my hashtags. So it's worth sacrificing what I want in this moment to strengthen a relationship because that relationship is on my list. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, again, that helps us to foster really good relationships. Her list and my list don't need to be the same, but I can do things that are on her list in order to bring both of us some satisfaction. Yeah. So recognizing that everyone has their own list, you know, starting to think outside of you and your individual list, but seeing that everyone has their own list, now you can use that as a tool for how do I communicate with and interact with this person in a meaningful way that could really enhance our relationship. And I think if you kind of globalize that perspective, you could start to even see their universal things too, you know, yeah. people in general, society in general, you know, if almost 2 billion people can have the hashtag love, I think that says something about people in general, our capacity, want, or, or affinity for love to some extent, I suppose. I'm sure with puppies or something is on there too. What does that <laughs> say about us that, you know, we're all very interested in enjoying a peaceful moment like that, where we can admire something innocent, something something precious like that. In a general sense, once you get a hang of this and you can start to really explore and zoom out and say, everyone has, you know, whether directly created or indirectly, a list of things that are really, really valuable to them. And I know for sure there are things that are really powerful Mm -hmm. and universal between all of our lists. So just like you were saying, you could enhance your personal relationships. I could see it how we could use this to enhance, you know, societal, communal relationships across different uh, group barriers and across Mm -hmm. social issues and things like that. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think as you were talking, one of the things that came up that we've talked several times about on the podcast is politics and how divisive politics Mm -hmm. are, right? And when you put it into this context of 2 billion times people have hashtagged love, that's way more people than we have in our country. Mm -hmm. So we have to assume that some of the people on the opposite side of politics than us or people who would vote a different way than us or people who value something different than us would be in that pool of people who hashtag love. 
And so when I know that and when I can understand that, then I can start saying, what is it about their life that they would have hashtagged with love? Yeah. And now it gives me something to be curious about. Now it gives me something to look for and to find commonalities and similarities about instead of just thinking, well, they're not like me and I can't be friends with them or I can't see the world the way they see the world. It gives us a place of commonality to say, perhaps something on their list is the same as something on my list. What could that be? Yeah. Yeah. Even just having that notion in mind, remembering this is a person who cares about love, just that idea in general, I think is enough to give pause because I think in as politicized an arena as we kind of live in now, the demons we fight on the other side are always less human than they actually really are Mm. in reality. I think, I think that's what this does. Somehow we've gone through Instagram and made a way of really humanizing each other rather than what I think Instagram typically seems to do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think that's really valuable. So I think mostly I just want to say thank you. Thanks for having engaging in this conversation because I think, as we take, in some sense, repurpose these hashtags, right? And say, this could be a barometer for how well I'm living the life I want Mm -hmm. to live. It can be a barometer for how well am I connecting with people in my relationship? How well am I thinking about other people's hashtags in a global sense? Mm -hmm. And it really could shift our perspective in lots of ways. Absolutely. This podcast is sponsored by the Solution Focused Universe, a global community dedicated to the growth of professionals who want to master the solution focused approach. The SFU is home to the world's largest library of solution focused material, which is updated on a monthly basis. Join fellow community members and solution focused leaders in coaching calls and private Facebook groups to discuss anything and everything related to solution focused brief therapy.